Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We will begin our webinar shortly. Um, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Jerry Green from the Pacific Council. I guess it's morning if you live up to the uh, mountain time zone. And then good day to all of our, our, our participants from places farther east. Um, I want to, I'm delighted to welcome you to, to um, this event on Ukraine. One of the things that, that we're very lucky at at the Pacific Council is when there is a global crisis someplace, we can um, very almost inevitably um, draw on our members to actually share their wisdom with their, their, their former, um, with, with their fellow uh, Pacific Council members. And yet again, we have uh, hit the jackpot. I want to introduce both of our speakers. I'm going to have rather brief introductions because their credentials speak for themselves. And I want to devote most of the time to protein, which is listening to them speak. But first is Dr. Anya Grigas, who is our go-to person on energy issues, uh, Russia is issues, Eastern Europe issues. She's an extraordinarily uh, good citizen. Um, she's a non-resident senior fellow at our SIB back east, uh, the Atlantic Council, and um, lives in Southern California, as do so many of us. Um, she has published three highly acclaimed books. I think it's sort of the hat trick. She has one with Harvard Press, one with Yale <laughs> Press, and I don't know what the third, you know, um, but but the hat trick of, of, of uh, of uh, academic publishing, and she has accomplished this. She is enormously um, expert, both on energy issues, Russia issues, Eastern European issues, former Soviet Union issues, um, and so forth. She really is at the intersection of policy analysis and, uh, um, and, and, and more applied activities, and that she's a speaker regularly and a consultant. Uh, to the private sector and is expert in the, 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 the sort of overlap between geopolitics and business, which I think is enormously important. So Anya, thank you yet again for joining us. I also want to introduce uh, Ambassador John Emerson. Uh, John is a longtime member of the Pacific. I always put this first as if this is, you know, the most important thing in people's lives. A longtime member of the Pacific Council Board, uh, which we treasure and, and uh, value. Uh, he was ambassador to the uh, Federal Republic of Germany. Um, and um, I always check when our members become ambassadors and I go to these countries, I always say, so how is ambassador so-and-so doing? And he got rave reviews from everybody in Germany. In other words, the German policy community and the German government, but also from the State Department that his, his work um, as chief of state, chief of mission, uh, there was yet another chief of station, chief of mission. Was, was highly acclaimed. He was a very, very good manager leader of the United States Embassy and the entire US uh, representation in, 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 in Germany. He's won numerous awards from the CIA, from the Department of the Navy. Um, he sits on numerous uh, corporate boards and uh, boards in our field, um, the American Friends of the Munich Security Conference, uh, the German Marshall Fund, um, and a variety of other things. So John is very, very engaged. And the story I always tell about him is he's a foreign policy person like me. I was at a panel with him and two Congress people, one current and one former, and he was more knowledgeable about domestic US electoral politics than both of the Congress people, which he never fails to amaze me with his, uh, his wisdom and his intellectual curiosity. I want to thank you both, Anya and John, John for, for joining us. Um, Anya, we'll start with you. What, you know, before we get to the questions, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Um, as we're all thinking, you think about Ukraine in an informed way. We think about Ukraine in a somewhat less informed way. Well, you know, it's impossible not to think about Ukraine now. Um, the last couple of weeks, the situation has really intensified. And, uh, you know, last week, U.S. Ambassador to the OSCE, Mike Carpenter, said the drumbeat of war is sounding loud. And, you know, I think this phrase actually went, uh, you know, across all the head newspaper headlines. But in fact, there are many signs that point right now to Russia's potential invasion of Ukraine. I mean, first, we have the 100,000 Russian troops near the borders. We've had a massive cyber attack on the Ukrainian government, on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Education. We've, right now this week, we are seeing Russia pulling out its diplomatic staff from Ukraine, from their embassies and consulates. 
We are also seeing a Russia's information warfare campaign right now against Ukraine to try to potentially kind of create uh, more public support among the Russian public for a potential you know, conflict situation. There are US intelligence reports that Russia has recruited operatives trained in urban warfare for this. I mean, again, we've had a breakdown in negotiations between Biden, Putin, and President Zelensky. Um, we, we also have the question of timing, and we have the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics. Now, for some, that may be surprising, but Russia in the past has started wars during the Olympics. Uh, for example, Crimea was occupied in 2014, right after the Sochi Olympics, and the Georgia War started in August 2008, literally during the opening ceremonies of the Beijing Olympics. Um, so, you know, there's the timing. And then there is another element, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, a gas pipeline, Russia's gas pipeline was just completed. So basically, Russia no longer needs Ukraine's gas pipeline system um, to transport, to export its Russian gas to Europe. So in theory, I mean, this was always a concern that once Nord Stream 2 is completed, Russia would have a freer hand for potential military conflict that could damage that important pipeline. So, but, you know, at the same time, these are all the signs right now. At the same time, we have to remember, Ukraine has already been at war since 2014 with Russia. I mean, the Crimea has been occupied. There's been conflict ongoing in Eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not like this is something completely brand new, but we're definitely, definitely seeing an intensification of the situation and potential for a new offensive. Thank you. Uh, John, I'm going to turn to you. And, and similarly, what, what's on your mind as you're watching this all unfold? Well, thanks very much, Jerry. And uh, Anya, it's good to be with you uh, uh, for this discussion. Uh, I, I guess several things. Um, first of all, I can't imagine that Vladimir Putin actually fears an attack from NATO uh, or from uh, NATO nations uh, on Russian soil or on Russian assets or what have you. Yet, if you look at what some of their demands are in these negotiations, they would appear to be premised upon that which begs the question about what is he really after there? Secondly, I think once Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine, you know, Russia had a tough, tougher time dealing with Poroshenko. He was, um, uh, I can remember a Munich security conference where Poroshenko came and gave a blistering speech from the podium and literally fanned out passports of Russian uh, soldiers. Remember the little green men who had actually been killed in the, uh, in the Donbass and the battles there. Uh, but uh, the hope, I think, when, when uh, Zelensky, who actually was a comic uh, and sort of an entertainment industry figure, was elected uh, because he talked about building a better relationship with Russia and what have you, was that, okay, this is a guy we can control. And it turns out it's, it's gone the opposite way. Uh, one of the ironies being the more Russia has squeezed Ukraine, the more anti-Russian sentiment has grown in a country that historically uh, has been pretty close to uh, pretty close to Russia. So I guess that's a uh, that's a second observation. And and clearly part of what's going on is uh, to uh, if not punish, sort of show Ukraine, show Zelensky, uh, you can't get away with, you know not even treating us badly, but, but trying to think you're not gonna be under our thumb. Uh, the third issue is obviously Nord Stream, which Anya mentioned. I think that's worth a, a broader discussion amongst the two of us, obviously. My time in Germany, uh, that was, believe it or not, that was a topic back in uh, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016. It, it, it certainly was accelerated in terms of the press with the way the Trump administration kept, kept hammering on it. But you know, and the Obama administration was adamantly against Nord Stream 2 as well, but that's, I'll, I'll defer that for uh, further and, and deeper conversation. But I would say, I guess my initial reaction is, Putin's already, uh, you know, basically pocketed a big win in this. Why? Because uh, before all this happened, what were we talking about? We were talking about Russian aggression. We were talking about Crimea. We were talking about the Donbass. We were talking about Georgia. 
Uh, we were talking about his support for uh, Lukashenko in Belarus. Uh, we were uh, talking about his cyber attacks, his efforts to uh, interfere with elections uh, in the West and particularly in the United States. And what are we talking about now? NATO enlargement? NATO enlargement, this is an issue that's 25, 30 years old. And, and, and the, the argument is that somehow uh, Secretary of State James Baker during the two plus four process made a commitment to Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would never, there would never be NATO troops uh, in any, uh, anywhere east of where NATO was already positioned. And, uh, and that all of a sudden, the, you know, Poland joining NATO, the Baltics joining NATO, uh, obviously, uh, you know, NATO troops coming into East Germany after reunification, was it just a terrible violation of this? Well, I'll tell you what, I talked to Jim, Jim Baker about that, to Secretary Baker about that back in uh, 2015, uh, when um, actually it was 2014, it was the, around the 25th anniversary of the, uh, of the fall of the wall, because this issue, you know, it's something that Russia keeps coming up on. It was, again, uh, an issue that Putin raised as justification for what they were doing in the Crimea and the Donbass was this NATO enlargement to the east. He said, first of all, the conversation never happened. Uh, I suppose if you were a lawyer, you could argue nothing was in writing. And, and, and if there was an agreement, it was with the leader of the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. But Baker just said flat out it didn't happen. The agreement was that for a period of years, two, three, four years, there would not be uh, NATO troops per se moved into the former German Democratic Republic, the former former East Germany. But that was uh, that was it. And at the same time, NATO was expanding eastward simply because countries who were democracies now in the former, you know, it, it, you know, Poland and the Baltics, for instance, and Hungary wanted to join NATO and were asking to join NATO, petitioning to join NATO. Um, that, that uh, you know, at the same time, they created the NATO-Russia Council and we're trying to, in fact, and there was even conversation back then, maybe Russia will join NATO. So, uh, you know, so the idea that we're now back to a conversation about some alleged agreement between Secretary Baker and Mikhail Gorbachev that happened some 30 years ago, and that this is outrageous and that bell has to be unrung is just preposterous. So the fact that we're talking about it and not talking about Russian aggression and their assassination of political enemies and all of that is a win for Putin right now. It's also a win for China, but that's another another conversation. Yeah, another good thing to explore. But Anya, let me ask you, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say it's another win for Russia, the fact that also we're not talking about, even if within the parameters of Ukraine, we're not saying, OK, uh, what's going to happen with Crimea? Uh, we're, you know, we're not saying, uh, well, what, what's happening with the Donbass? We're now again worried, will there be a greater offensive? Will there be a greater offensive? And, you know, analysts are assessing, will, you know, will they create, um, you know, a land, uh, t you know, bridge uh, from, you know, in Eastern Ukraine to Crimea, or will all of Ukraine be invaded and so on? So, you know, again, we're, that's already a win. In some places, Putin can say solidified his gains already. And now we're debating like his further potential expansion. And that's, that, thank you for that, that last uh, sentence, because what I was going to ask you, Anya, is, is um, Russian troops have been withdrawing from Kazakhstan, um, you know, which in and of itself is, is quite, is, is quite remarkable. Uh, Putin is talking about sending Russian troops to the Western Hemisphere, uh, you know, places like Venezuela and so forth. Um, you know, and, and, and so there's, there's sort of a global conversation that's going on now, which is very reminiscent of the way we've been talking about, about China. You know, China, you know, uh, it's, its port policies in Western Europe and so forth. So thinking even more broadly, Anya, what, is, what does all of this signify? And is this in part a consequence of four years of basically coddling of Vladimir Putin? Um, you know, we're not, we haven't even mentioned election meddling in the United States, which yes. is a whole other issue. But Putin got a four-year sabbatical to do anything he wanted. He could do no wrong. I mean, it was better to be president, you know, the head of Russia than a member of NATO or the EU in Washington. I think this is a consequence of that, but I could be wrong. You know, I, 
I think it is a consequence of that, but I think it goes uh, more than four years. I mean, I think it is a general consequence of America's uh, more inward looking foreign policy, um, you know, for decades now and be beyond, uh, you know, the Middle East. And I think in terms of other Russia's wins, we've also seen, you know, um, Russia in incredibly active in the Middle East. Um, beyond just Syria, beyond Afghanistan, but naturally they've they've scored great wins there. They're seen as a real player now in the Middle East. And I heard that back, I think I was in Israel, maybe 2015, I'm somewhere around there. And that's what I've heard, heard meetings with you know, experts and analysts um, there. They're, they said, well, we don't really see the US now as a player in the Middle East. We see Russia as a real player, a deal maker, and someone who's gonna stick to it. So I think uh, Russia has been emboldened in many regards uh, by playing kind of the long game of some of its key, key, you know, key aims and key goals. And I think it has uh, built up, uh, you know, greater presences, greater, I mean, again, North Africa as well, the, the bases there, its involvement, uh, particularly with energy sources, the joint um, uh, military uh, trainings with China, so I would say that Russia has managed somehow to re-emerge as a military power, which, um, you know, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have really thought of Russia that way, even, you know, maybe even 10 years ago, we would have been skeptical of that. But I think it has managed kind of re regain that, you know, at the same time, it has also emerged as a highly, iso in, you know, highly isolated from the Western world type of power. And I think that has shattered a lot of uh, hopes that many people had that somehow, you know, even uh, Ambassador Emerson, you mentioned, you know, there were natural, I remember those discussions well, that maybe Russia could be part of NATO, maybe, you know, it, and it, it, it did have a seat as an observer and so on. So I think a lot of those goals or hopes have been shattered. John, I think just a, just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first of all, uh, you think, you, you know, you, you can't, analyze what a foreign leader is doing without looking at their domestic political situation, right? And I think we in the West, you know, I talked about the Baker thing, but one thing that we clearly underestimated uh, was the extent to which there was a great national humiliation with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. You know, and you had people who had been basically sold a bill of goods, waiting in long lines for groceries, you know, sort of suffering, paying a price, but being told this was the greatest government on the face of the planet, the greatest country on the face of the planet, the greatest system on the face of the planet, or that a governmental system had ever been, you know, invented. And the whole thing just fell down like a house of cards. And then Russian people are a proud people, right? And, uh, and so there was this tremendous sense of humiliation. I was struck being in Germany during the, uh, the whole uh, situation it's back in 2014 with the illegal annexation of the, Don of the Crimea and the invasion of the Donbass and the shooting down of MH17 and on and on in the effort to try to you know, get sanctions from uh, the EU to be more consistent with the sanctions that we were imposing in the United States, which Angela Merkel really played a leadership role in. But what really struck me was during all of this, Putin's approval ratings in Russia, which weren't all that good before this annexation of Crimea, they were down in like the 40s because things weren't going too well economically, shot up into the 90s. And there was almost this sort of national, uh, you know, sense of, hey, we're back, you know, as a player. And so, you know, you sit and you look at, you know, what Anya's just talking about, what they're doing in the Middle East, what they're, you know, I mean, Jerry, what you mentioned about the Kazakhstan, other things that they're doing, playing more of a leadership role. There is clearly a domestic political imperative to that for Vladimir Putin, particularly given that the economy is still not working too well. That Russia does not make much, if anything, that anybody else wants to buy, except for the oil and gas in their ground, right? And so, uh, so that's, you know, that's the first point. The second point is when you look at Kazakhstan and you look at Belarus and all that, it's pretty clear to me that Vladimir Putin see, and you look at uh, when, uh, what Yan Yanukovych fled Ukraine when there was the, you know, the protests on the Maidan and the, you know, the, the color revolution in, uh, in that country uh, back in 2013, 2014. 
Uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is Vladimir Putin feels a lot more comfortable with a bunch of frozen conflicts on his borders, you know, with a nice, uh, you know, sort of a cushion, if you will, uh, between Russia and, you know, in effect, what used to be the former, uh, you know, nations of the USSR and alliances within the USSR, and uh, if you can call them alliances. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it seems to me that also from a geopolitical standpoint or a geostrategic standpoint, he's kind of doing everything he can within these various countries. My understanding is he hates Lukashenko, right? I mean, there is not a good personal relationship there, but he's backing that guy because he likes having Belarus, you know, under, under his thumb. My guess is he's probably not that enthusiastic about the leadership in Kazakhstan, but he's going to back that guy because he you know, doesn't want to see, the last thing he wants to see is color revolutions on the border of Russia, giving the Russian people ideas. So I think those are two sort of, in effect, domestic political imperatives for Vladimir Putin that drive what's happening now in terms of his foreign policy approach. And I wanted to follow up on that. (laughs) Sorry. But, um, both points. In fact, the first, certainly Russian public opinion. And uh, there are public opinion polls taken every so so many years in Russia. And you know, I've seen the results of these polls. And one, there is one foreign policy priority that the Russian people continuously, you know, poll highest on um, year after year, from the 90s to the 2000s to present day. And that priority is really that Russia reestablishes um, the power and influence of the Soviet Union. So this is essentially um, a public opinion poll that the Russian public generally is in agreement with, again, from the 90s to present day. Another element of when it comes to public opinion, now, okay, Vladimir Putin you know, has a pretty free hand in the way he runs his country, but he's very, very mindful of public opinion. And I would say he may even follow that even more closely than American presidents. He watches you know, how these numbers go up and down. And whenever we've seen real dips um, in public opinion, that's when we've seen offensives. We've seen also the Georgian war in 2008. That was at the dip of uh, Putin's popularity. And again, the Crimean offensive again in 2014 at the dip of his popularity. And we also have seen another offensive that actually brought Putin his popularity. And that was the uh, the Chechen, uh, the Chechen wars, basically, you know, when Putin just came to power, the Chechen wars, and my, my dog came to say hello, you don't see him, but he is <laughs> trying to get on my lap. So um, basically, that was uh, when Putin's popularity really skyrocketed when he was a new leader. So he learned those re- lessons very well. And I wanted to just second that on the frozen conflict. So for those who are interested, I can, this was my second book, this was Beyond Crimea, the New Russian Empire. And specifically, I look at um, how these frozen conflicts are beneficial to Russia, because Russia doesn't have to invade all of Ukraine. Um, by simply creating these frozen conflicts, it prevents the country later, like, and this has happened with Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, then the countries can't really focus on other foreign policy priorities. And the reality is, as long as these countries like Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine have these frozen conflicts, these separatist regions, they're not going to be admitted into NATO. I mean, that's another reality until this is resolved. So I think Putin, you know, when he's claiming right now that what his big negotiations that he wants no NATO membership for Ukraine or Georgia. He knows there'll be no, no NATO membership until these frozen conflicts are resolved. Let me ask you both a, a question. And this is, I, I, I'm, I'm really unsettled by the question I'm gonna ask you being a peace loving person, but are we not showing up at a, at a gunfight with a knife? I mean, so Jake Sullivan goes, oh, we're gonna impose all of these economic sanctions. And I'm thinking, you know, Putin is sitting there, Mr. Judo, you know, rides around on horses with, you know, this this sort of macho guy. And, you know, he can call Tehran and, you know, he can call Napida and talk to all sorts of places where, you know, where where economic sanctions haven't worked. And there's something odd about NATO being a military alliance saying we are going to eschew the very instrument that, you know, (laughs) <laughs> that we're based upon. I get it, but I, I you know, I, it, it's, I don't, 
see it as, as being terribly compelling. Well, let me, let me uh, make two comments on that. Number one, this isn't a NATO mission. Right. Ukraine is not a NATO country, right. as, as Anya pointed out. And there probably isn't a single NATO member state that would want Ukraine to be a member company, country because they don't want to have to deal with Article 5 in uh, getting into a shooting war with Russia uh, in defense of Ukraine. So the reason you haven't seen NATO moving troops and material is, it, sorry, you're not a NATO member state. Mm-hmm. So whether you're attacked or not is irrelevant to us in, in that sense. And, and you're not going to get the kind of consensus within NATO the way we had, say, with Kosovo uh, or Afghanistan, where they're, where, where they're going to go in and, and participate in, in a mission. And again, the Afghanistan mission was as a result of our invocation of Article 5 when we were attacked on 9-11. So that's point number one. Um, the, uh, the second point is uh, in terms of arming you know, Ukraine. I mean, the way we deal with Taiwan is very different from the way we've dealt with Ukraine. I mean, Taiwan, we're, we're selling them weapons left, right, and center, right? And we've been doing that for years. Uh, Ukraine, I, I was in multiple, you know, probably three or four bilats with Merkel and Obama. Uh, either on German soil or, or back in the Oval Office, where this whole topic of Ukraine and arming Ukraine probably took up 30 to 45 minutes of discussion time. I mean, it, this was the, you know, once we got, you know, slapped around a little bit on the NSA and, and listening to her cell phone, it was, it was basically, the, that was the focus of, of the discussion in pretty much all of 2014 and 2015, and even in, in a little bit into 2016. But, but that was the focus of the discussion. And the, the part of the focus that was where there, what was really interesting was Barack Obama kept saying, I am under a lot of pressure from people within my administration. And I can tell you who some of them were, uh, including some in the State Department, by the way, uh, and from members of Congress, to send lethal offensive way aid to the Ukrainians. And at this point, what we were sending them was defensive aid. We were sending them radio, communications equipment, you know, Kevlar vests, uh, you know, that kind of thing. We weren't sending them these, you know, like Stinger missiles and or or whatever the Germany has some missiles that we used and uh, that we sent to the Kurdish Peshmerga. Ukraine was oh, we'd love to have some of those. And the reason was because Angela Merkel made two points. First point was she was then taking the leadership role in what was known as the Normandy process, which was Germany, France, only because they started the discussions at one of the uh, one of the commemorations of uh, D-Day at Normandy. But Germany, France, Russia, and uh, and Ukraine uh, to try to and these were the negotiations in Minsk to try to reach some sort of resolution to the crisis in the Donbass, which you know, never obviously fully uh, played out. Uh, And she wanted the diplomatic space to do that. But the second reason I thought was more compelling, and she actually gave a powerful speech at the Munich Security Conference in that period of time, uh, making this point, which was, let me just tell you, we give Ukraine weapons, it'll be like, you know, this is my phrase, but like playing poker, you know, I raise you 100, it'd be great. I see your 100 and I raise you 500. And, and she just said, look, you know, having lived through the Cold War, particularly on the other side of the wall, because as you recall, she grew up in, you know, the former GDR, she goes, it, 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 these people are not going to be outgunned. And all, we, all we're going to do if we basically give them more offensive weapons and sort of amp up the, you know, the firepower on the Ukrainian side as it gets used is Russia is always going to be able to overwhelm that and just take the next step and the next step and the next step. So that actually isn't uh, a way out of this thing. And um, I don't know how much of that is driving that because Merkel's obviously no longer there, but I don't know how much of that is driving uh, what, uh, you know, the current administration's thinking is on this, as you were talking about the Jake Sullivan comment. I do know that under Trump, there was, I believe there was offensive lethal way aid that was uh, sent to Ukraine. And they're obviously way better armed today than they were back in 2014. Uh, but but I, I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, argument that she made. And certainly Barack Obama bought it. Anya, what do you think? So 
You know, first um, on the sanctions. So, you know, Russia has been under sanctions since 2014 and they've learned to live with it. And, uh, you know, obviously it hurts. It has an impact. I won't say it has no impact, um, but at the end of the day, you know, the U.S. has had this experience with other countries, with Cuba, with Iran, and to really alter dramatically, uh, you know, a country's foreign policy, sanctions for, you know, authoritarian states are not enough. Um, I think uh, the Russian government can also take the long view because also, the, you know, their government structure, um, they can say, okay, well, you know, we're just going to suffer it. We're going to just tighten our belts or we're just going to bite down on this for the next 10, 15 years. And again, that would not be feasible in the United States where we, you know, every four year elections. So leaders wouldn't be able to take these types of longer term, you know, calculations. When it comes to, you know, arming or not arming Ukraine, you know, I, I, yes, that argument was popular and certainly Russia can always up the ante, but, um, you know, it, and lethal weapons were provided by the Trump administration. I think when Ukraine was asking for it and they were asking to buy it, um, I don't think also we can morally decide that, you know, we know better and you don't need it because you're going to be worse off. So therefore, we're not going to sell it to you. Um, I think it provides another, you know, coming from me also from the other side. So, you know, I grew up in Lithuania in my early childhood and the Lithuanians fought a partisan war against the Soviet occupation for almost 10 years. Um, and this is my grandparents' generation. And I know a lot of people at the time really expected that the West will come to help it sooner or later. And I think people, you know, there was great disappointment when, you know, no help ever came because really people fought, you know, without weapons, understaffed, no support for 10 years against the Soviet Union. Of course, the fight was, you know, not one they could win, but still they hoped. So I think in this case as well, I feel, you know, sympathy for people who are trying to defend their country. Hungary, 1956, um, Hafez, uh, Bashar al-Assad crossed a red line with chemical weapons. Um, we let him get away with it. And Russia walked away with Syria. So there, you know, there, there, there is a, a, a history here, um, which, which can be followed. And I guess what I'm trying to understand, and, 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 and it, you're both making this point really well, it's so hard to under, understand what will motivate Putin, what will, you know, what will, I mean, he's, he's burst onto the global stage. If nothing happens from here and he gradually withdraws his troops, He's accomplished an enormous amount. I, I fear, and but again, it's it's the question is what will what will get his 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 attention, um, if anything, if anything. I think at the end of the day, Putin, or I would say even if it's you know we just use Putin as interchangeably as the Russia, yeah. the Russian government, the Russian elite, right? But I I think the Russian government would not let go Ukraine easily. I mean, this is really a, you know, a geostrategic country. I mean, this is the largest European country by, by land size, 44 million people, um, you know, natural resources there as well that haven't been developed. Um, you know, the pipeline system that used to go through Ukraine carrying all of Russia's or most of Russia's gas to the West. Um, there is also, of course, the historical connection, um, you know, the Slavic nations, so there is also the belief that if Ukraine truly goes west, you know, becomes a Western democratic country, you know, aspirant to join the EU or NATO, that this also bodes well for the Russian system in itself, um, right? It just raises the question that, hey, well, if Ukraine can be a democratic free country, Western oriented, then why can't Russia itself, right? Uh, certainly raises those questions for the Russian public. So I think this is a long fight. I think this will be a frozen conflict for decades. Um, you know, it's the big question is whether we will see this kind of offensive right now and the, how that could potentially be mitigated. John, can I ask you a question about domestic politics, which you always know far more about than, than, than you know, I imagined and until you remind me, you know, that this is something you're very knowledgeable about. Americans tend not to be motivated by foreign policy considerations um, in, in elections. Um, the midterms are, are coming up. Um, you know, the White House is, you know, there's going to be a presidential election three years and so forth. 
Um, there are new actors on the global stage. You know, China's the su suddenly has become the hardy perennial um, as a global, <laughs> which it's actually relatively recent. Russia seems to have joined that club. Um, the United States has, you know, as a result of Afghanistan, Iraq, and so forth, is 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 less willing to to engage and even to deploy militarily. We've pulled, you know, we never had a lot of troops in Africa, but we they were dispersed all over the continent. Many of them are gone. The Wagner Group is showing up, which are Russian mercenaries. The Chinese are every, you know, everywhere, literally in the UAE um, and so forth. Uh, you know, how how do you will the American public ever realize that these issues matter? Um, you know, is foreign policy ever going to become a, a preoccupation in this country? Or is the United States going to suffer the, the fate of all uh, great empires, which, you know, is, is, is to cra gradually diminish? I know, you know, Yogi Berra always said it's hard to predict, especially about the future. So I, this is not a fair question, but I'd really value your thoughts on it. Well, first of all, in terms of the midterms, the key issues are going to be uh, inflation and COVID. And how's the economy doing? But that sort of plays into the inflation. And not even how's the economy doing? What's the perception of how's the economy doing? Because the economy and people are actually doing much better than what the public polling suggests. I, I don't think, uh, to the extent uh, foreign policy plays into it. Um, I think it's more likely to play into the presidential election than it is uh, the midterms. The one way, I guess there are two ways that foreign policy really plays into uh, elections. One is if things are going badly and we look weak, think Jimmy Carter and the helicopters crashing in the sandstorm uh, in Iran, think Honestly, I, I think this is going to be something that will, the Republicans will certainly remind people of uh, the, the way our uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan played out. Um, I think the Vietnam War and the way the withdrawal from you know, Vietnam played out. Uh, you know, the way the extent to which foreign policy works well politically is when you come in, you're strong, you have a quick win. Think first President Bush in Iraq. Uh, in the first Iraq war, think Ronald Reagan and Grenada. And we basically invaded a vacation island in the, uh, you know, in the Caribbean. And uh, boom, remember the fa famous picture of the student, you know, arriving back in the United States and bending down and kissing the tarmac. Uh, you know, th th those are examples of foreign policy, uh, you know, events that really, really helped. I think that the way foreign policy is playing out now increasingly is uh, much more in terms of its impact on economic policy. And the Biden administration, and by the way, you know, Trump got this. He wanted to get out of Iran, I mean, Iraq. He wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, he wanted to focus on China, not so much, well, we want to be more of an international player with China, so let's invest a lot in countering one belt, one road. He wasn't talking like that. It was about trade and China taking advantage of us economically, right? And, uh, and, and so when Biden talks about a foreign policy for the middle class, what he's talking about doing is how do we make what we're doing around the world or how do we communicate better about the importance of our foreign policy objectives in a way that uh, ordinary Americans will say, hey, that can impact my life too, which is sort of a fancy way of getting back to the point that Anya made at the very beginning of this, which was for a while now, we seem to be much more inward looking as it relates to uh, or our foreign policy. But I do think with regard to uh, a particular president, the idea of looking weak uh, is not helpful. I think, the, honestly, it was Obama's second term, but the whole Syrian situation where we allowed Assad to cross a red line and didn't immediately punish him. I mean, I understand what was happening there. I mean, the, uh, I, it was my job to start trying to sell, uh, you know, response uh, against the Syrian, uh, against the Assad regime to the Germans. They were looking at me like I had horns growing out of my head. You've got to be kidding. You're going to get engaged in a third war in the Middle East. You're already in Iraq. You're already in Afghanistan. You're going to get engaged in a third war in the Middle East. 
And then, of course, when there was a diplomatic solution to that, which was the destruction of the nuclear of the chemical weapons, not really because they were just used again a few years later. Um, that that you know the Obama administration sort of grabbed onto that. But uh, but the fact of the matter is, I don't think a president of the United States can draw a red line in the sand, have it violated, and not immediately and forcefully retaliate. Uh, but but the Biden administration's got a lot of work to do. Uh, to explain to the American people why some of the things you were talking about uh, are, are very important. I, I think the other piece he's trying to do, and this may be is, I, I'm not sure how it plays in middle America, but this idea of authoritarianism versus democracy. I mean, that's what a lot of, a lot of uh, what you're talking about is, is really all about showing people that this in fact is a system that works and can work for them. And that personal freedoms are not worth giving up uh, for a strong man, uh, boss, in effect, who uh, you know maybe uh, creates appearances of being able to be more effective at getting things done. But have, it's a problem. Thanks, John. Um, I we have a question um, which I'm going to direct to you, Anya, and then John, I'd like your your thoughts on this as well. And and uh, this is from Mark Nathanson. Um, and this is not a, a theoretical question. It's for him a very practical question. Uh, Mark is asking, um, do, do, you, do, do you both believe uh, that Russia will accelerate threats towards other European neighboring countries, uh, specifically the Baltics, Finland, and Norway? Anya, what do you think? So I think if... Uh... Russia is very active in this region already. So let's not, not be naive. It's active in terms of intelligence. It's active in terms of its vested interest groups it has built, um, in terms of military exercises. I think if seeing an opportunity, if seeing a weakness, I think Russia would certainly take advantage of that and try to make inroads. So, you know, in the Baltic states, certainly, um, you know, they have uh, Russian minority populations. Russia has tried to exploit that unsuccessfully, you know, for the last three decades, again, unsuccessfully, really, um, because the, you know, the Russian speakers are very happy in the, in the Baltic states. But let's say if there was any, any a pretext, they would certainly do so. John, what do you think? Oh, well, I mean, I, I think that, um, I, I mean, I would agree, obviously, with what, uh, with what Anya said there. Um, I think Russia already is uh, messing around, if you will, uh, not just with states and its border, but with uh, within and around the EU and, and in the transatlantic relationship. I mean, it's a clear geopolitical objective of Vladimir Putin's to drive a greater wedge uh, between the US and Europe, uh, to drive a wedge between and among NATO member states. Uh, and between and among EU member states. I mean, we saw that play out in the effort to get the EU to build consensus around sanctions. You had some member states, it's like, whoa, I don't wanna you know, piss off Russia. I depend too much on them for trade or oil or gas. That's a topic that, that has come up in this context again as well. Um, and and you know, the uh, interference in, in elections, the uh, the cyber attacks. Uh, I, I mean, you go back to you're talking about the Baltics to what they did with Estonia back uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, two thousand seven. Unbelievable, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of that. So, uh, so they're doing everything they can to try to, you know, uh, create divisions. Uh, and and you know, people. I don't think people understand how difficult and challenging it was to get the EU member states to not only get together in the first place with regard to these sanctions that, you know, as Anya says, Russia is, you know, sort of learning to live with uh, that were imposed uh, back in 2014. But then, you know, that had to be reviewed every six months and reapproved every six months. And if it wasn't for things like the shooting down of MH, you know, 17 and it, you know, and, and things like that, I, I'm the not sure we would have gotten it done, yeah. Yeah. you know, so, uh, so they're, yeah, they're, they're great at that and they continue to do it. And it's not just confined to the Baltics and Finland and, yeah. and, and yeah, know, I'll also emphasize, it's not just co confined to Russia's neighboring countries where certainly this is where, you know, they have the greatest capacity, but there really hasn't been an important election uh, in the last uh, seven, eight years where Russia hasn't played a hand. I mean, Brexit, 
U.S. elections, the French elections, the Yellow Vest protest movements, the Dutch elections. I mean, essentially all of them, they have you know, operated either in terms of cyber warfare, information warfare, and so on. Let me ask a, 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 another question. Uh, well, I have to, this is a question for one of our members, Rob Begland, who was back at the day at the Pentagon. And Rob's question is about NATO enlargement, the future of NATO, um, things of that sort. And I'd be curious to hear what, what both of you think about the, the future of, of NATO. NATO was created at a very different time. Um, you know, I, when I was at RAND, I actually worked on NATO enlargement. Um, and I remember going to NATO and seeing Russian, as, as uh, you both mentioned, Russian military officers strolling the halls of NATO in uniform speaking Russian. So, you know, things change quite a lot. What's, you know, what, what's NATO going to look like going forward? How does it, is it redefining its mission? I know NATO is thinking about China, uh, as it should be, um, but I'm curious how this will affect um, and I think Rob Eglund is as well, how this current situation will affect the future of NATO. Well, I think folks that are deeply committed to NATO owe Vladimir Putin a big, you know, kiss on the cheek, because the, the fact is, when I went through my confirmation process back in the spring of 2013, there were article after article that would wither NATO, you know, well, what should NATO's role be, whatever. And then when, bam, once that Ukraine thing happened, we had uh, you know, we had multiple meetings with uh, key NATO nations and uh, member states and, and their American ambassadors, uh, you know, on European soil with our military talking about Russian aggression, how to counter Russian aggression, steps that we were taking. So I would say, number one, there's, a, there's an example of NATO. The second thing that we haven't mentioned at all, and this, you know, to Mark's question about Norway, the Arctic. I mean, I think the Arctic is going to be a huge play, both from the standpoint of energy exploitation, but, but uh, just uh, geopolitically. I mean, now all of a sudden, you know, it's, uh, you got ships that, that are going to be able to go all the way through there and everybody's putting their, you know, their pole in the, the water, if you will. Uh, I think the Arctic is going to become uh, an area of great strategic, if it hasn't already, great strategic importance uh, for NATO member states and, and for Russia as well. Anya, could you say a few words about the Arctic as well? Because yes. I, 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 it's absolutely imperative. And, and uh, uh, plus the climatic changes, John mentioned ships being able to sail through. Also, the melting of the permafrost mm -hmm. is affecting, you know, abilities to deploy not only militarily, but the whole, you know, people laugh about, don't laugh, but they don't take climate change as seriously as, as they should, uh, ought to pay more attention to the Arctic, where, by the way, China also um, considers itself an Arctic power. Well, yes, uh, Russia, I mean, China has declared itself an Ar Arctic power. Um, it has great in interest in terms of when it comes to shipping and shipping routes. Um, I think one thing we've, we've noticed that, um, especially from, from the energy sector um, that I've studied when it comes to the Arctic, um, the more, you know, the Western Arctic countries, uh, the US, uh, Norway, others, they have uh, essentially when the energy prices were low, um, a lot of investment kind of, kind of stopped from the exploration because they were driven really by commercial interests. But uh, during this past 10 years, we've seen Russia, for example, and China really keep up and really stick to their Arctic exploration, Arctic investments, um, energy development, because they view this much more than just a, you know, a commercial, you know, profitable or not profitable uh, project at the moment. They view this as a long-term game, specifically important for geostrategic reasons. So I think we'll see even more commitment and more tensions going forward in that regard. Let me ask, uh, uh, Steve um, English and Richard Wheeler have both asked variants on the same question, which is, um, you know, Nord Stream energy, um, you know, the, the reliance of Western Europe on, on, uh, on Russian sources of energy, you know, the one foreign policy issue that Ted Cruz seems to think about, um, you know, repeatedly. Um, has the current situation changed anybody's thinking about this, uh, you know, Anya, this, you write lengthy and, and learned books on just this, this topic, Do, uh, you know, is, is, is your next book going to be 
you know, looking at this from a different perspective? Is this OBE? You know, I'm just curious more broadly. So, you know, things have changed uh, with the global gas markets. Um, there is less opportunity for Russia to use, to really use energy and gas as a weapon. So there's less opportunity for that because again, countries are now, you know, there's a liquefied natural gas that can go on tankers anywhere in the world. Um, the United States has emerged in fact as the largest natural gas producer in the world. And again, an LNG power. Um, so from the one hand, countries that maybe before 20 years ago, something like Nord Stream 2 could have really, you know, Russia could have really like turned off the tap if it wanted to, once it had completed this project. Today, that's not the case. Um, at the same time, I view this project as, uh, you know, Russia seeing that it's losing the game in essence, you know, lo losing that kind of monopolistic power over energy. And, try, and trying to still implement a project like Nord Stream 2, so it would be able to maintain um, the, its key markets in Europe. So that's for, for specifically Germany, its key market, the largest importer of Russian gas in Europe. And the second one is Turkey, which they have built the Turk Stream for that. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's, uh, I think what those pipeline projects will create will just deepen the relationship between Russia and Germany, for instance, deep in interest groups, that's all gonna be beneficial to Russia's foreign policy. But I don't think we have to fear those types of gas cutoffs um, as we did in the early 2000s. Nonetheless, we've seen this fall and this winter, we've seen Russia do try to put a squeeze on the European gas markets. We've seen European countries have to draw down on their gas storage supplies. We've seen European gas prices soar in some countries significantly. So, you know, they can still play the game, but not, you know, free handedly as before. I would say I agree with that 100%. And, and when people like, um, you know, Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and others would, would tell Angela Merkel, uh, you know, you guys are going to be completely defend, dependent on Russia and so on and so forth. I mean, she basically would laugh at them. I mean, that, uh, you know, multiple sources of energy, they'll be more expensive of course, but multiple sources of energy. At the same time, Germany was, uh, you know, working on Nord Stream 2. They were also building regasification plants in uh, Wilhelmshaven uh, up, up on the North Sea, uh, just in to deal with that kind of a situation where they could get the LNG coming from the United States and other places. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, yes, would, would the German business community like to see Nord Stream 2 turned on? Yes, the Social Democratic Party, of which Olaf Scholz is now chancellor. Uh, the last chancellor from that party is Gerhard Schroeder, who chairs the board of the company that's building uh, uh, and is on the board of Gazprom, but they chairs the board of the company that's building. The people we used to sardonically say he was bought and paid for by Vladimir Putin. Putin threw him a 70th birthday party, which was created a somewhat of a scandal in German in the German press, uh, on and on. But um, the fact is, you know, Merkel made very clear uh, that uh, in the event of an invasion, now of course the question is what, how do you define invasion? And that the trickier thing is these little gray area attacks that, uh, that Putin almost certainly will engage in and how we respond to that. But an invasion that absolutely Nord Stream 2 either wouldn't be opened or would be shut down. And my understanding is that Olaf Scholz has re, um, reiterated that commitment. And let's not forget Yes, you have the Social Democrats who all, even in Merkel's coalition, where the party pushing more for Nord Stream 2, uh, ironically, because they're less a party of business, but they're more the party of Ostpolitik and let's build a good relationship with Russia. But now the Green Party is in the government and the Greens are very much against Nord Stream 2, both for geopolitical reasons, uh, in part the impact on Ukraine and all that, and also just for climate change reasons. Uh, they don't like natural gas. And so and the, the foreign minister, uh, Annalena Barbach, is, uh, is a Green. So the, the Green Party actually, their platform as they were you know, running uh, in this last election was tougher on Russia and tougher on China for human rights reasons and everything else than either the, than, than either, uh, you know, the Olaf Schultz uh, proposal or the Merkel uh, Schultz government uh, from the last four years. So 
Uh, it's not at all, you read this in the press and the, the Ted Cruz thing, we've got to sanction Germany right now because they're not going to, you know, they're going to keep Nord Stream open no matter what. I don't see that happening. Uh, and, and Anya, your comments about, you know, just sort of the changes in the world of, of natural gas availability and oil and gas in the last few years really reinforce that. Let me ask you both a, a, a question, and then I'll give you each a couple of minutes to, to kind of um, end things. But but I've always been very interested in, in, in what is called Paul Mill, the, the relationship between political considerations and military considerations and how um, at times broken that relationship is, um, which we really can't talk about today. But Anya laid out a whole bunch of things that, 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 that Russia is doing to prepare the ground in Ukraine, should it wish to engage militarily. But based on the things it's done, it probably doesn't necessarily need to engage militarily because of all of the other things that they've done, which is a variant of what's happened, you know, they've done with US um, elections and elect, you know, Anya again gave a long list of things that Russia has done. Are we as a country, not only we, but our Western European allies, again, I just forgive the metaphor, showing up at a gunfight with a knife. Um, it's it, it's just that things are going on, which which I often um, am concerned that we're just not addressing them. Um, and for you know, countries always prepare to fight the last war. Well, a we haven't won the last wars. Um, and B, the next wars are not going to look like the past wars. So what are we learning here? It's a very different world. I'll give you a final insight, and then I'll turn it over to both of you. I was watching Cynthia Teyes' confirmation hearing for Ambassador to Costa Rica, and all they were doing was asking now Ambassador Teyes questions about China. When does China ever come up in the confirmation of an ambassador in, in, in Central America? Similar things are going to ha happen uh, with 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 uh, with Russia uh, as well, and so I'm just if you would both you know reflect on the future of Paul Mill, I think it would be you know very helpful. Anya, we'll start with you, and then sure. John. So I, I see two big shifts right now, um, which are you know broader beyond uh, Ukraine, broader beyond Russia. I really see that right now we globally are in a sort of division between authoritarian and democratic states. And I think mentally we're still more, we still remember more that, you know, capitalism versus communism, a type of showdown. But I think today we are, we are in a geopolitical competition between democratic and authoritarian states, and that will continue. I think as democratic states, in some regards, we are more vulnerable. Uh, we are more open societies. We are, uh, you know, again, dependent on election cycles. We have a shorter term, potentially planning period that we can pursue and our interests. We are media, our information systems can be penetrated more easily. Our business interests can be more penetrated more easily. So I think this is something we will have to come to terms with. The second area now looking uh, you know, big, big idea, I would say for the US, I think the US and the American public maybe is starting to come to terms with or will have to come to terms to, to, with in the coming years, the fact that we are truly no longer um, the sole superpower. And I think for a lot of people that still, you know, that still looks like a way is away, but it, that's really, we're starting to feel those realities. We're starting to feel uh, China's influence. And the fact that, you know, American teenagers are on TikTok already rather than on Facebook or Instagram is very telling. Um, the, you know, Chinese investments across the world, uh, Chinese, uh, you know, plays in Africa, in Eastern Europe, I mean, countries in Eastern Europe, in Slovakia, Lithuania, you know, these countries, they worry about China today. They talk about uh, China probably as much today as they do about Russia. So that's very telling. And I think for the, the American public, this will be a transition as we come to terms that we're no longer the sole superpower and that we have some serious, serious rivals that we have to contend with. Well, I mean, I, I would agree with all that. I, I would say, I think less about 
Paul Mill, which is, is always been important. And, you know, the Paul Mill person in any em or people in any embassy are, are crucial is the, that balanced relationship. We also got to think about the interrelationship between foreign policy and economic policy. I remember John Kerry regularly saying, you know, economic policy is foreign policy and foreign policy is economic policy. And uh, uh, it, it, you, you look at economic policy and public diplomacy as tools for countering the sort of disadvantage that, that Sonia pointed out that, that perhaps democratic regimes have to uh, foreign regimes in part because of our, uh, you know, because of our um, openness. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're actually now talking about something that for the last previous four years we ignored, which is how we counter uh, China's One Belt, One Road initiative and the foreign, you know, now part of that is grabbing some of these countries uh, economically, you know, you don't pay your loans, we own those ports or whatever. Uh, but, but, you know, but there's also a, a public diplomacy benefit to that of China being involved in investing and helping to, you know, grow those economies ostensibly, the extent the money doesn't go into people's pockets. But the, but the fact that we're now talking about how do we play much more of a proactive role in the developing world, in uh, helping, you know, small businesses emerge and in supporting women and supporting education uh, and uh, building schools and doing that kind of work and putting more and more resources in that, uh, I think um, is, is actually just as important, maybe even more important than throwing around our, you know, our military might uh, around the world. And I would also say, and I'm not just saying this because um, of my role with, uh, with, with uh, Capital Group, uh, but, uh, but the, the role that the investment community has, I think it's gonna be very interesting to watch uh, how this ESG dynamic develops and uh, you know the obvious place where you can see an impact happening is when the it's one thing for governments to argue about what should happen in terms of carbon emissions or whatever but when the investment community almost on mass starts saying to companies you better start paying attention to this stuff uh, that's going to have uh, that's going to have a big impact and when the investment community uh, and, and, you know, obviously it's not monolithic, but it's beginning to happen more and more because of demands of investors, uh, whether they're pe big pension funds or, or you know, individuals uh, saying, you know, we don't want to invest in companies that are doing business with authoritarian regimes uh, or that are making cloth from, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, or making goods from clothes from cloth that are, you know, developed by the Uyghurs. Uh, and I know, by the way, Lithuania, your home country, I believe, has been really strong on that. Uh, but uh, but when when the investment community starts having that kind of impact, uh, I think that's going to play uh, play out in a very very significant way, uh, just in terms of this authoritarian democratization uh, a, a dichotomy that we've been talking about. Let me end with a, with a, a comment by a member, which I, and, and he put it for uh, Michael Mathisian, who said it far better than I could. This was a great discussion. Both panelists were comprehensive and granular at the same time. Uh, very Thank impressed. you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. I can you. only agree with, with, uh, with Michael Mathisian. Me too. And we ended thinking, you know, and this is uh, this is the political scientist in me that that you know lessons learned from a particular political issue more broadly and globally how we conduct ourselves as a nation going forward. I can't thank you both enough. Um, I I'm, I'm sure we will do this again. And thank you so much that, that you know for all you do for your fellow Pacific Council members. We're indebted to you both. Thank you. And uh, audience, thank you for joining us. Have a good thank, day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.